the situation is very difficult. The Chinese forces are already reached. Now time come, leave. It was one of the most daring escapes in history. Fighting breaks out and forces the Dalai Lama to escape the invading Chinese. Exactly, Danokro. I left from Nuklinga. I had a hunch that I'm going on an important mission. My job was to go and receive him, ensure his safety, and bring him back to the plains of India safely. Real danger is there. Danger on our life. This is the story of what happened, told through the first-hand accounts of the Dalai Lama and Harmander Singh. This is the last photograph of the Dalai Lama taken in the Free Tibet. In order to practice love, you also need practice of tolerance. What we lack in this world is a little bit of compassion, a little bit of kindness. With the challenges we all collectively face today, young leaders are rising up with strength, courage, and conviction, making meaningful changes and impacting the world. Sisters and brothers, I really appreciate so many people Dalai Lama is calling for more young people everywhere to rise up and to lead a new generation and to create a compassionate worldwide revolution based on love. Anything that we do, particularly political moves, which affect so many lives, if it's not governed by some kind of an ethical value, then we have become like animals. Hi, greetings. Uh, this is a special podcast at the time of still in the Ukraine and there's still the Holocaust atrocity massacre, the massacre of the Ukraine, Russia's war there. And uh, it is also at the time, three days before an amazing event happening in America which is a release of a film called Never Forget Tibet, uh, made by Compassionate Films out of London. And it will open in 800 theaters in the United States uh, alone, and I don't know how many in Europe and wherever else, because, but only for one night because of the Chinese Communist Party terrorizing all media and artistic people and everything where they can't have mentioned Tibet and they can't do this and that, like some horrible thing they have just done to poor Keanu Reeves, actually wonderful, not poor, but wonderful Keanu Reeves, just because he felt like making a beautiful comedic performance in between, <laughs> in between all the massive John Wick, you know, wonderful events that he, martial arts things that he does and other things. And he did, uh, where he read a poem of Allen Ginsberg. And he didn't mention Tibet, but he did it as a benefit for a cultural organization that does, does remember Tibet. So it's such a remote connection, and yet they mercilessly are trying to harass him in order to terrorize everybody else in Hollywood, as well, not to mention punish him. I mean, what kind of ridiculous behavior is this? But the reason, one of the things I want to stress in this moment is this is because a tiny little group of people in the standing committee of the Politburo, and it looks like maybe even one tiny little person, you know, although he's not as tiny as Mr. Putin, but Xi Jinping, Mr. Xi Jinping is still relative to the vast mass of humanity, one tiny little person. And you know, the technologies of our planet are such that we cannot allow 
this kind of one tiny little egomaniac person to control, be able to massacre and kill and punish and control the thought of millions and billions of people. This is simply technologically unfeasible and impossible. And it, we, the masses of people on this planet, have to rise up in a leaderless, loving way, not a violent way, but in a leaderless, without any one big leader person, rise up and say, no, you, you, even you start out as a good person, and maybe you have some good intention, but you get to this focus of energy where your slightest flicker of the finger, pressing of one button could annihilate the whole planet. And you, you, it's not possible that you should be put in such a stressful situation, even out of compassion for you and for all the living beings on the planet. It's compassionate. All right? So I want to make this point because this is the point of the Dalai Lama. When the Dalai Lama said in the 1990s and has repeated ever since, he might have said it sooner than that, that this next century, but I said it about the century, so probably around then, this next century may, cannot be a century of violence and bloodshed and massive world wars like the previous, like the 20th century. 21st century may not and cannot and must not be that, he's saying, and will not be, actually. He was simply predicting a scientific fact that we cannot afford this kind of thing. We cannot stomach it. And even the tyrants who cause it don't enjoy it because they attract the vibratory hatred of so many people. And everything nowadays is so transparent. And everybody knows what everybody else is doing. And our interconnected minefield, Facebook is the name of one company, but they're all, all of these companies interconnect us. And you can't really turn them off. You know, and we don't want it because people don't want to turn them off. And actually, strangely, the, the tyrants and the fanatics think that through them they can control all the people, but they can't because everybody sees everything. And so this is just a fact. War is obsolete. And egomaniac tyrants and dictators and kings, even if they're egomaniacs, are obsolete. You can have a ritual movie star kind of king if you like to have the social, cultural... Uh, feel of it, you know, like the look of it, but they can't have power to press buttons and do things. No. And that, and nor, nor can even a bunch of weird corrupt senators have such a power. Somehow there has to be this distributed, really the ideal of democracy, where decisions are made by constant referendum through the internet to everybody involved. And that's the way of having Definite peace, definite plenty, plenty, not no super huge poverty and starvation for anybody, and no wrecking the planet and the environment, which is what feeds everybody. And th those individual high people, they can't do that. They can be rich people. There will be still rich people who will do creative things, probably more artistic type of people than just people playing with numbers. But there will be. Then that's fine for people to be rich. But they will from their karma. But where their, their, their riches are related to wrecking the planet and destroying the environment and sucking oil and burning it and polluting the air, polluting the ocean, polluting the water, polluting the earth, polluting the wind, that can't happen. We, we, because we don't need to, because we are happy people. And we know how about that our happiness relates to everybody else's happiness. We all are interhappying. We're interliving. We're interbeing. That's what it is. All right? Now, at this moment, though, we're still suffering with the spillover from the pre enlightened century of the KGB and the CIA and the Gongandu or whatever it is that they call their secret service in China. 
and the and the raw or something in India, the bigger countries, you know, and the M6 and the the Sécurité and the whatever they are, you know, in in the in the bigger industrial or smaller pollution po population countries, and if we go on like this, it'll be black South Africa with high tech and nuclear weapons, and it'll be Nigeria with nuclear weapons, and it'll be Kenya, and don't give me some race crap. Everybody has them. Everybody will have them. There's no non-proliferating by few people ordering other people to non-proliferate. There could be non-proliferating because nobody's scared of anybody else because people are demilitarized and they voluntarily do so and they know that and, and there's no need for terrorists because people, you know, the terrorist families will not be killed by state terrorism, by carpet bombing, by civilian bombing, which is state terrorism and is not only, I mean, all war is a crime, but within that there are crimes of civilian bombing, but even with the old time when war was not obsolete. So this has to be said outright, you know. At the moment, the brave people of the Ukraine, which includes the babushkas, yeah, I don't know, I hope that's a Ukrainian word as well as a Russian word. I know they're close to similar. They're less Slavic languages. Fellow Slavs if not fellow Russians, uh, not fellow Ukrainians, but they're fellow Slavs. So even the babushkas are there with guns, and they're ready, they're staying there, sending off children, but they're staying to fight. And they are standing up against this dictator, this one person who has a fantasy that everybody has to be what he wants them to be, and everybody has to think and say and do what he wants them to do. We had those people before, Stalin, we had the would-be ones in the America, some CIA people, some OSS. You know, Gandhi predicted that when the Allies fought the Axis, so-called evilist people, that the evilist people among the Allies would take charge of the Allied societies, the Maoists and the Stalins and the CIA people in the States and uh, whatever in Britain and France so-called five, five powers, who's the other one, I forgot. But those, those, three, those three bigger population ones and the two smaller pop, former colonialists, France and England, and their bad people would take charge. And so it's those people still controlling and trying to pull us back into the bloody century. And, and we Americans are guilty of that too. And, and those people spilling over and not seeing the current reality, they don't know it, they're stuck in the past. But we cannot tolerate them. We love them, actually. We don't hate them. We hate what they're doing. We don't hate them. Zelensky is a comedian. He's not a bad guy. He's a comedian. He, he know, again, he's a theater person and a television person. And they know they interconnect with thousands of people, millions of people daily. And they can't radiate bad vibes. So he's been good as a leader because he feels his people. Like, a, like an actor does. Act, actors, acting is a great profession. It's an artistic, it's an altruistic profession. Great actors are altruistic, of course, because they sense their audience. You know, you, people might think they're egotistical. They can play egotistical people. They've been in a lot of roles of this kind of dictator and tyrant and crazy person, horror movies and things. But in the future, there'll be new roles, new excitement. But they are altruistic people. They're wonderful people. So we, this Ukrainian thing has only one solution. It, we all have to be Ukrainians. I loved it, you know, like, the, like uh, the Italians who loved the Tibetans. They went out to the Chinese embassy and when the Chinese were persecuting and massacring Tibetans the most recent time, 2008, because Tibetans were showing off a little, they were like expressing themselves. You know, they didn't, they didn't do anything violent that time. There were some fake ones, acting, sent by Chinese, pretending to be Tibetans, and anybody who knows them knew it was not the Tibetans. And then they massacred a lot of Tibetans because of that, and they've had the place locked down ever since, just like the Uyghurs. But they, they basically have the place locked down for 70 years. China has three Ukraines, at least, if not more, but three for bigger ones. I, I, I'm sorry, there are 55 different so-called minority nationalities in China. But I'm sorry, I don't know the names of all of them. Maybe the fourth is the Manchu. But those are four big ones. 
and they and the Chinese were been vengeful and vindictive about the Manchus who conquered the Chinese and humiliated them for 300 years, much worse than the Westerners, actually. And they've been persecuted since, and they've kind of disappeared and assimilated. But there were millions of Manchus originally and probably still. So the Tibetans, Mongolians, Uyghurs, which now people are seeing, and Manchus, those are Ukrainians. And they've been 50, 60, 80 years, 70 years, they have been being assimilated and basically genocided by the Chinese, more or less openly or not openly. You know, and more invisibly though, like in the old century way, because you don't have connection because they block. Tibetans have been killing themselves like the, have been sacrificing their lives like the Ukrainians are, but they've been doing it nonviolently because of their Buddhist ideals and also because of their confidence about being reborn. And so they burn their bodies in front of the enemy. They burn their own bodies to show like you can't dominate us. That's their way of showing freedom, which is a unique specialty wasn't a Tibetan specialty in the past, but they they achieved that. T terrible. We would tell them not to do it, just wait them out rather than do that. But they are doing it. Two, almost 200 of them have done that so far. And then the, and the Chinese shoot them once they're burning because they're so freaked out by it because it's where they're escaping from the power of the egotentrical domination hierarchy coming from small people at the top because normal Chinese don't want to do that. Normal Chinese, they want to be happy. They want to be rich. They want to have fun. They want to, they 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 worship. They worship Tibet as a land where their rivers come from. They have deities and heaven realms in Tibet in their mythology. If they knew their mythology, as the communists didn't allow them to learn it, but if they if the ones have come to know it now, they love the Tibetans. There's hundreds of millions of them love the Dalai Lama, love Buddhism. They don't want to dominate destroy any Uyghurs and the Buddhists don't mind Muslims really a few crazy ones but it's uh, it's in Burma it's not the Buddhists doing that really it's the generals nasty generals did it to fool the Buddhists Buddhists didn't propose it properly I quite agree so this is worldwide war this is the world war of now and the Ukrainians are the heroes but we all have to win it with the Ukrainians that doesn't mean we all have to go over there and shoot Russians. It means that we have to keep clear in our mind what it is. And whenever the Putin lunatic decides he better try to seem sane and he better like back off and maybe pretend he won something and then they normalize and then people will forget about it. And then we have someone who wants to be Putin in America, a crazy Trump. We have to fight that. He will do the same harmful thing. The reason they fight other people is they do it when they get unpopular with their own people. When they don't have people out going yay to them anymore. And they realize, I mean, maybe they can get a few, but they realize by polling that they are really unpopular. At that point, it, throughout history, they will go and attack the neighbor. And, they, and then they'll even, be, they'll even collude with the ruler of the neighbor because he's getting unpopular probably, and then they'll vent the hostility, the resentment of the people being oppressed by the tyrant, uh, to, that the enemy is the other people, right? and then they'll get them to kill each other. So then they won't overthrow the tyrant, to follow. But unfortunately, the way it's going in history, when they overthrow the tyrant, in the different French Revolution, American Revolution, or Russian Revolution, etc., when they overthrow the tyrant, because they do it violently, the new guy is the worst tyrant. Right, right. He starts out with a good intention, liberating everybody, then he becomes a horrible dominator, worse than the most corrupt emperor, czar, king, queen, whatever, monarch. Because at least some, for several generations in monarchies, they try to train the crown princes or princesses to be good leaders and care about the people. And the crown who comes up in a violent war, they just low violence, power comes out of the barrel of a gun and therefore then they oppress everybody under them really violently and badly which is why Russian Revolution didn't turn out well so now we have a new war war a new revolution and that's the revolution of the people with love the people who demand happiness and they know that they want ha they want the license to be happy themselves and they know they can't be happy really by making other people unhappy 
so they so they don't try to oppress and destroy and harm and domineer and bully other people. And we've reached that point. And also male and female have become therefore more equal because of that. Because women always were ahead of men in knowing that. They didn't want all those wars. They told their men, don't do that war. No, no, don't kill my son. They told the king, and the, but then they were immediately executed and kicked out and not listened to. But they've known this for a long time because they're more realistic. They're more aware of interbeing as the beloved late, but very present now, after death, after death of his ordinary body, very present, Thich Nhat Hanh, in love with the Mother Earth, in love with all the world's people, Whereas you are and I am, we are in love with everybody. Even the bad guys, we're in love with them. We are. Poor guys. They, they, the most pathetic one down there in Mar-a-Lago and the other most pathetic one in the, in, the, in the Kremlin basement threatening around with nuclear weapons and horrible things they can do to everybody. And the most pathetic ones over there in Zhongnanhai, which is actually the Manchu Emperor's throne camp. You know, it's an imperial thing, pretending to be communist for the people, but they're in an imperial throne, egomaniac's house, which should just be a museum. They should be live with people in it, but they could have a big mansion if they've worked hard, but they, they should live on the street with the people. And because that's, then they feel happy because they like, to, they like to have friendly neighbors. They know they have no friendly neighbors. They have all these bodyguards and security. They're scared of them because they're oppressing them. And all the people owning all the oil companies and the sheikhs in Saudi Arabia and in Iran who want to sell oil. And they turn their whole world into just, the whole country into just an oil business. Never mind destroying the planet. They won't turn it off because they're too scared to go out and live among people. They kill even people who tape something about them. They're so nervous about, about people not liking them. Whereas if they were still living on the street, they might have a bad mood one day and be, kick a dog or something, and then somebody would scold them, and then they'd learn to then make up to, to the dog. So when they get in a bad mood, they can't harm so many people as someone who has huge power over life and death over people and huge weapons. That's not possible. So that's the revolution. Volodymyr Zelensky is leading the violent side of it, the Dalai Lama is leading the nonviolent side of it. I think we should see to it that the Ukraine becomes under Volodymyr after he wins by repelling the Russian invasion, because uh, because the way to repel it is to make we have to make it help them repel it. Makes it too unpleasant for the dictator who is maintaining it, and realize that he will lose everything if he keeps it up. But then the, the, the final resolution cannot be where he can then build up more power to invade again or invade the next group of people, which is what he wants to do because of his fantasies and his fear of the regular people around him. Because he's an old, he's in the last century, he was trained as a secret police where they torture and kill people at, at will. And they, life and death, they, are, they have a 007. Well, no. We don't have such people in the future. We do not. We love everybody. So they don't kill people. And we have to see to it that Ukraine could be a zone of peace. And everybody would agree that everybody else cannot invade them. And maybe get the guarantee at first because, they, you know, we don't want a regime change there. It'll be if eventually the Russians will have to decide to do it themselves. They'll realize the impracticality of this. They'll decide to do it. I, maybe the oligarchs will decide to turn some of their excessive mansions into museums. They'll sort of try to re-enter re the forgiveness of the people whose son they had killed for an unnecessary invasion and stupidity and whatever, or from writing the wrong article they ex tortured and executed. They have to try for forgiveness. And they, they did it in South Africa. They had forgiveness. They had tutu. But there are tutu. There are Russian tutus. There's Ukrainian tutus. There's American tutus. There's Chinese tutus. There's Tibetan tutus. There's every kind of tutu for reconciliation commissions. There can be a world court, international court, 
a recovery could sign up to, but that there could be an international reconciliation commission next to the court rather than just locking them up forever. You only lock people up to try to educate them. They're correctional facilities, they're called. They're not called punishment facilities. We don't do that. Civilized, in European, they don't do capital punishment in civilized countries. They do rehabilitation because they love everybody. Even murder, even bad guy could be good if they were re-educated, retrained, they had a different vision, they had a different experience, they had nightmares about it, they saw their karma, they, they were received teaching of how to find the knowledge in their mind because even they're human beings and because they can understand reality. And reality is against the act of killing another living being, basically. Reality allows you to flourish when you save every life. And then you can get more life. Plants give themselves to you, so it's okay. And plant diet is healthier anyway. <laughs> okay. So, let's hear it for Ukraine, but let's remember Tibet. Let's remember the Uyghurs. Let's remember the Yemenis, which is America's blame. And the people who are still selling whatever it is to the Saudis, let's remember Saudi Arabia, they're to blame. Let's remember starving people wherever, Kenya, Ethiopia. That's, that's a joke, that's no good. That guy had a Nobel Peace Prize and he goes and they kill and starve all these people. No, no, no. Médecins Sans Frontières is helping the Ukrainians. They are right poised on the Polish border. Many of such people, we help them. We do everything we can to help the loving people. And we don't allow this idea that loving people are weaker. Loving people are stronger. Volodymyr is showing that. And his Ukrainian people. And we love them. They have a culture house. The brother organization, sister organization to Tibet House on 15th Street is the Ukrainian house on 79th Street and 5th Avenue. We're between 5th and 6th on 15th. Let every oppressed culture have a house in New York and in D.C. and in Moscow and in Paris and London and in Beijing. And no dictators oppressing and killing off and is trying to assimilate and increase their power because they're scared of their neighbor. They never want to conquer somebody thousands of miles away to make themselves feel bigger, which doesn't satisfy. So then they want to conquer more. Believe me, the bigger enemy of the Russians are the Chinese and vice versa. They are not allies because Russia is hogging too much land that too many Chinese need. So actually, in a, in a better world, beyond the 20th century world, they would allow them to farm that land. And they'd be up there making it beautiful and producing more things and stopping the, stopping the stupid uh, melting of the permafrost in Yakutia and in northern Siberia. But the Siberia is huge and there's not enough people there. And they can invite some Chinese and they don't have to have a war, which I prophetically saw in the 1980s. Uh, they don't have to have that. Please, 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 Siri, take a break. Okay, so that's what I have to say today. And don't worry, and also don't be frightened by him with his nuclears. He's not going to shoot any nuclears. He can't. God won't let him. <laughs> the angel Gabriel will stop him in his own head. He will not, because he knows that's the end of life. And he has beautiful daughters. And he has, his si he has a human side, that particular bad guy at the moment. Actually, very criminal guy. And we, we don't want that from any of these countries, and we certainly don't want it in the, in the U.S. There have been a bunch of them here, and we don't want them. And we're going to, but we love, because we love them. If you go kill a lot of people, you reach, you go to hell yourself. Whatever you think hell is, you go there. That's what happens to you. You don't live well after killing people. Okay. Thank you so much, and go see Never Forget Tibet in one of the 800 theaters if you're in America, 
or wherever it might be playing and, uh, and ask them to run it for more days. <laughs> I'm sure it's a quite cute. It's about the little, the little dilemma escaping and some things about it, but it's really getting to know the leader of world leaders who has no country. He's been in exile for most of his life. And he, he says still, no, he doesn't want a vengeance on the people who are genociding him and his people. And he's, got, he's inspired his people mostly not to want such vengeance, mostly. Not, nothing's perfect, but mostly. And not to, not, even they are furiously angry unto death, but they'll only give their, get rid of their own body. They won't murder a bunch of people with them. With them. And that's extraordinary cultural level that should be respected and honored and learned from. But we have that extraordinary cultural potential in all of our cultures. We just, under the charge of nowadays, too easily controlled by people who are stuck in an earlier time when they thought it might be efficient to have one lunatic running the show. And it's obviously totally destructive. And we can't afford it anymore. No one. The Russians can't. We can't. The Chinese can't. People have to have local control over their destiny. Okay? No big dictators and empires anymore. Thank you so much, everybody. All the best. Have a great day. The situation is very difficult. Chinese forces are already rich. Now time come, leave. It was one of the most daring escapes in history. Fighting breaks out and forces the Dalai Lama to escape the invading Chinese. Exactly, Danokro. I left from Nobleka. I had a hunch that I'm going on an important mission. My job was to go and receive him, ensure his safety, and bring him back to the plains of India safely. Real danger is there. Danger on our life. This is the story of what happened, told through the first-hand accounts of the Dalai Lama and Harmander Singh. This is the last photograph of the Dalai Lama taken in the Free Tibet. In order to practice love, you also need practice of tolerance. What we lack in this world is a little bit of compassion, a little bit of kindness. With the challenges we all collectively face today, young leaders are rising up with strength, courage, and conviction, making meaningful changes and impacting the world. Sister. And brothers, I really appreciate so many people. The Dalai Lama is calling for more young people everywhere to rise up and to lead a new generation and to create a compassionate worldwide revolution based on love. Anything that we do, particularly political moves, which affects so many lives, if it's not governed by some kind of an ethical value, then we have become like animals.